Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. I pray that our time together in God's word today is a blessing to all of us as together we grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We begin today with a reading from Psalm 21. Lord, the king finds joy in your strength. How greatly he rejoices in your victory. You have given him his heart's desire and have not denied the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings. You place a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked you for life and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your victory. You confer majesty and splendor on him. You give him blessings forever. You cheer him with joy in your presence. For the king relies on the Lord. Through the faithful love of the Most High, he is not shaken. King Saul is becoming more and more unstable. And we're going to see his condition grow worse as events continue. But through all of this, through this very difficult time in David's life, the Lord is training David for his service as Israel's king. Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. But Saul's son Jonathan liked David very much. So he told him, my father Saul intends to kill you. Be on your guard in the morning and hide in a secret place and stay there. I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are and talk to him about you. When I see what he says, I'll tell you. Jonathan spoke well of David to his father, Saul. He said to him, the king should not sin against his servant, David. He hasn't sinned against you. In fact, his actions have been a great advantage to you. He took his life in his hands when he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. So why would you sin against innocent blood by killing David for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan's advice and swore an oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. So Jonathan summoned David and told him all these words. Then Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he served him as he did before. When war broke out again, David went out and fought against the Philistines. He defeated them with such great force that they fled from him. Now an evil spirit sent from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his palace holding a spear. David was playing the lyre, and Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear. As the spear struck the wall, David eluded David, or David eluded Saul, ran away, and escaped that night. Saul sent agents to David's house to watch for him and kill him in the morning. But his wife, Michael, warns David, if you don't escape tonight, you will be dead tomorrow. So she lowered David from the window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michael took the household idol and put it on the bed, placed some goat hair on its head, and covered it with a garment. When Saul sent agents to seize David, Michael said, he's sick. Saul sent the agents back to see David and said, bring him on his bed so I can kill him. When the agents arrived, to their surprise, the household idol was on the bed with some goat hair on its head. Saul asked Michael, why did you deceive me like this? You sent my enemy away and he has escaped. She answered him, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him everything Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel left and stayed at Nayot. When it was reported to Saul that David was at Nayot in Ramah, he sent agents to seize David. However, when they saw the group of prophets prophesying with Samuel leading them, the Spirit of God came on Saul's agents, and they also started prophesying. When they reported to Saul, he sent other agents, and they also began prophesying. So Saul tried again and sent a third group of agents, and even they began prophesying. Then Saul himself went to Ramah. He came to the large cistern at Seku and asked, Where are Samuel and David? At Nayot in Ramah, someone said. So he went to Nayot in Ramah. The Spirit of God also came on him. And as he walked along, he prophesied until he entered Nayot in Ramah. 
Saul then removed his clothes and also prophesied before Samuel. He collapsed and lay naked all that day and all that night. That is why they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Paul and all those who were with him on the ship headed for Rome have shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Paul will spend a rather eventful winter there before they are able to set sail again and finally arrive in Rome. Once safely ashore, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in since it was raining and cold. As Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the local people saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to one another, this man no doubt is a murderer. Even though he has escaped the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But he shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no harm. They expected that he would begin to swell up or suddenly drop dead. After they waited a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now in the area around that place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Publius's father was in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went to him and praying and laying his hands on him, he healed him. After this, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So they heaped many honors on us. And when we sailed, they gave us what we needed. After three months, we set sail in an Alexandrian ship that had wintered at the island with the twin gods as its figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, after making a circuit along the coast, we reached Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and the second day we came to Pudioli. There we found brothers and sisters and were invited to stay a week with them. And so we came to Rome. Now the brothers and sisters from there had heard the news about us and had come to meet us as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. How does a person come to believe in the truth that God reveals in scripture, especially when that truth, the truth of the gospel, is nothing but foolishness to natural human reason? The 20th century Lutheran theologian Werner Ehlert talks about that in our theological writing for today. Faith places man before God. Man knows that God is calling to him. The hearing of the divine call is incompatible with the psychologizing explanation that man, by the power of his intellect, has lifted himself up from the conception of an angry God to the conception of a merciful, loving Father. For just as he is unable to free himself from the powers of the world and of death that surround and restrain him, so he is unable to escape the thou shalt of the law, the annihilating verdict of his conscience, the baneful conflict between shall and must. But that call cannot be mere information concerning a new concept of God. For the mere statement that God forgives sin would, in connection with the primal experience, or in German, ur erlebnis, have to make God appear as an inconsistent lawgiver and a soft-hearted judge. To believe this would amount to substituting a sure experience of the divine wrath for a wish that is founded on nothing at all. Actually, however, the concept of forgiveness of sins was a paraphrase of the Lutheran concept of the righteousness of God, in Latin, justitia dei, insofar as Luther himself understood this righteousness to be the righteousness given to man as a gift. Thus, the concept moves at once into a greater continuity of ideas. Here, first of all, it is stated in a much more elementary manner than in the concept of forgiveness of sins alone, that God even though he forgives man for transgressing, still does not cease to demand righteousness, in any case does not desist from demanding that a man must be righteous. On the one hand, of course, this intensifies the feeling that there is a contradiction. On the other hand, however, it states that the same God pronounces judgment and bestows grace. 
Our hymn for today is a stanza from the morning hymn, Awake My Soul and With the Sun. Direct control suggests this day, all I design or do or say, that all my powers with all their might in thy soul glory may unite. And we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you delivered us from the enemy through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, with whom we are united in holy baptism. Continue to deliver us, we pray, from our diseases and afflictions by your merciful gift of healing, as you feed us your holy food and give us the cup of everlasting life to drink. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you again for spending this time in God's word with me today. God richly bless your day, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.